isn't that expensive for the, um, uh, the insurance? Yeah, so, uh, so I imagine the two, it's, it's in the bundle, in your bundle, they're covering for the fees. But uh, that 2G, 3G, typically they don't bother to mention because it's, the data is very minimal, very, very small. Uh, once you start to go to 4G, then you have to talk about planning. So get a plan, you know, get, get it from your most common vendors, so you're doing T-Mobile or at and or whoever is in the market. Um, and that's where these new startups, so like, um, um, I think one of them, it's, um, it's called uh, Volio or Vio or something. I'm, I don't know, but there's a few of them that, that were, to, you know, launched together and they will start to create this, well, they're aiming for a platform with a variety of apps that you can deploy on it. So, you, you know, to, to use on your phone that plug connects to that uh, dongle. Um, and, and there were like minor changes. So either the modem is built into the OBD2 or the modem is, is using your phone. So you're using your phone for, for as a data access point. So that's another avenue. So you, can, you start adding a little bit of hardware to, on top of the vehicle to enable features. And that um, is why, I mean, I mentioned this OBD2 for a reason because enabling level two autonomy on, on a vehicle that doesn't have level two, but it's level two capable, um, that's so something so you could define. Please define what's level two autonomy. Oh, yeah, sorry, I jumped. So, so there are five levels for um, autonomy d d defined by by the Society of Automotive Engineers: one, two, three, four, and five. And uh, level one has no no autonomous. Um, so it's our regular vehicle. Functionality: your regular vehicle. Level two has some autonomy, um, and we can link to the detail exactly of uh, of uh, what goes exactly into each uh, level. Uh, but the, uh, the key message is level two has um, functionality like the, uh, automatic uh, braking and uh, it does some automatic parking for you. So it has enough sensors to do these functionalities. Which is now in the, like, the high-end commercial vehicles, the OD. Typically, yeah, your, your, your high-end, like your, your upper mid-tier to the high-end is what you have. Um, there are very few that are level three and level three means you can, uh, on a highway specifically, uh, in some sections, you can let the car drive itself, but with always an interaction with the driver. So you cannot let the go of the steering wheel and just fall asleep. It will not work. It will so it'll, it'll always require some driver engagement. So it's an um, upgrade on the cruise control. Correct. And uh, for example, and their commercial names change. So I think uh, GM calls it uh, Super Cruise and uh, Hyper Cruise. Um, and Tesla has, um, uh, I forgot their commercial name for it, but it's, that's the commercial name. The functionality is still the same. They all meet the same functionality. There isn't many above that. And now there are experimental systems, for example, Waymo, like a level four or five, but these are all experimental and you, you wouldn't see it yet deployed on a mass scale yet. Uh, but when you get in a car, it will not exceed, uh, typically will not exceed level two. And, and if you go to downtown Dubai, you would see there's an autonom autonomous uh, kind of uh, bus that uh, yeah. uh, goes, uh, that you know, ha has a certain uh, specified track that goes back and forth. So I yep. tried it myself, you know, and uh, I stood in front of the, the, it's a kind of a small bus, so I stood in front of it and it automatically stopped, you know, <laughs> moving. So So people are... People are trying uh, trying it out, and I think Dubai they have a, a program to, um, you know, to yeah. uh, to promote autonomous driving very pretty soon. Yeah, yeah, and and again, so so when you start thinking of what can you add to the car, and you mentioned the example in Saudi Arabia about uh, somebody enabling the level two yeah. uh, in a, in a Ford. Um, so I just want to close the loop on that. There is a startup in San Diego. Um, I'm not sure it's a, the, the person who started it is um, his well-known hacker. Uh, his name is, I think, George, George Hodds. Uh, very famous for hacking the, the PlayStation and famous for other hacks. Uh, and his ultimate hack now is to hack the car. And his startup adds a, some hardware with a phone. So it's basically they get a Samsung phone and they would um, uh, jailbreak it, put their own OS on it plus a bunch of other sensors, a camera, a, um, and then uh, they only work on a specific set of vehicles. So they have a list of vehicles that their users are um, reverse engineering the database, the CAN database on it and providing it to the, because as an owner, it's my car, I'm legally, I have the right to see what's on my car. So they would scan the CAN bus 
and figure out what is running on the vehicle and then they put, send it back to the company. They call these bounties. So they collect bounties from each uh, user and owner in their network. And then the car will have this small, very, very relatively cheap. I wouldn't call it cheap. It's, it's uh, almost a thousand dollars added extra uh, of equipment. You'll add it on top of your, uh, your car and you have to mount it in a specific way. Um, given that the car is in their database and you connected everything correctly, um, I just, and the vehicle, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. I just wanted to just tell our viewers that uh, you know the CAM bus is kind of a messaging or networking protocol for each each and uh, every part uh, of the vehicle to talk to each other. So it's kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. It it stands for controller area network. So it's like a just like a, there's a local area network for PCs. This is a network dedicated for the controllers in the vehicle. So it it manages the the, the vehicle functionality. And, and it's an old standard, very, very old standard. But, but given that you have all that ac access to all that data, so all these preconditions, so this startup is promising you a experience sitting between level one and level two. So meaning that you can let go of the steering wheel in a specific set and between certain speeds. So it's a nice added feature, like their ultimate goal is to sell you a kit that you can install on your car. And you can just yeah, yeah. Like it, yeah. So yeah. and then you make your car a semi semi or, or some level of autonomy, so you, you can uh, you know driving between two cities long distance. And I imagine Saudi Arabia has very long distance. You just buy this kit. Your car is compatible. Pop it in, and uh, and just let it go, right? And forget about it. like between on the highway from this marker to this marker, I can just let go of my steering yeah, wheel and let from, the car drive. From Jeddah, from Jeddah to Riyadh is like ten hours. But yeah, right. So so you would benefit from. Um, you get some more time to do other things, like, you know, so, so make I think phone calls or... Taif, Taif and uh, Riyadh, it's kind of a complete straight desert road. So it's... Uh, yeah, yeah. So you, you want, you know, having that on a, on a uh, roads that are easy to drive on, and I imagine roads, their quality is, is good. Um, it makes sense. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically the... Just touching on what kind of startup. So you got your application on sitting on the computer on what we call head unit in the infotainment system, or you have some added components you can plug into the vehicle data bus to either actuate an action or collect data and provide more information to the end user. Um, that's how I see at least in the private ownership, uh, which is more prevalent in the Middle East, right? So you got mostly private owners uh, of their own vehicles. And we can bring on... Uh... Hala, he works at uh, BMW to talk about, uh, he works at, uh, with electric cars, so. Yes, yes, so that I mentioned, there's two, two vectors, the automotive industry is getting uh, revolutionized. I think the, the digitization, so you're getting all that info, accessing the vehicle information, and providing service, and adding all these applications on top. And then you have the other one is the, the powertrain, which is the, the platform that drives the vehicle. Mm -hmm. That is also getting revolutionized at the same time. So you got the top and the bottom, that is getting electrified, electrified um, and presents its own problems in, in, uh, in the product itself. So, yeah. Right. But yeah, so if we move on from private ownership, um, we touched on Karim. Um, I, want us to, I want to touch on, this is just, an, just to explore, is you've got rentals and there's two types of rentals. You've got your traditional rentals, meaning there's an office, there's cars, like a car lot uh, full of cars. You go there and rent your car. And then as you have your... Yeah, like uh, Avis or uh, Hertz or... Hertz, uh, Enterprise, or yeah. Enterprise. That, that is, yeah, that rental. And then you have another form of rentals that is um, very common in Europe and the US. Abu Dhabi here in Saudi Arabia. Sorry? Abu Dhabi in Saudi Arabia. Or in <laughs> yeah. And the other one is, is the... Um, is, uh, is, but more like a short-term rental. So when you need it, you rent it. And if you don't need it, you drop pretty much anywhere. So uh, there's also a variety of vendors. Uh, Car2Go is an example in the US. Zipcar is in, in Europe. Zipcar is in the US. Um, so you just grab a car for a few hours or whatever, and then drop it almost anywhere if they have a deal with the city or in a specific parking lot. And you don't have to worry about parking. You don't have to worry about any added fee. It's a, it's a one number. You pay. Covers your insurance, covers your gas, covers everything. Just go do your thing and drop it off anywhere. Yeah, I see that. Um, I, there's, I believe, um, you drive. It's called you drive. You drive, yeah. 
yeah. So, so if we look there, what is the landscape in for rentals in in the Middle East, Saudi so Arabia? Currently, I see it's um, all traditional. So the Avises and um, the Hearths and whatever, and uh, you see, uh, I don't, I'm not sure in the Saudi Arabia if there's um, there's an example of uh, uh, of Zipcar. I believe that in Riyadh there is. I think I drive or something. Uh, there, there is a company that's operational in Riyadh, and there is an mm. example in uh, New Drive. Maybe I'll link link it down below. Okay. So there are a few examples of that. You know, local local examples of uh, startups uh, operating in that field, but still, on, I believe on a small scale. Very small scale. Yeah. Yeah. So so now, again, the, now the, big, yeah. the biggest sector that's disrupted is the uh, you know uh, car sharing. Uh, market which is the taxis you know the taxis are being disrupted in the region exactly so so when you talk about uh taxis so you got your traditional taxis that are getting disrupted by uber lyft kareem uh type of um because the it's a service based it doesn't own any car and uh it's easy to offer it's basically just a platform for you to rent a not a, rent a car just get a taxi yeah, get a taxi. Yeah. And you have uh, now Karim is part of Uber, and I believe um, the public investment fund in Saudi Arabia, they already invested uh, you know, billions in, uh, in, in, in Uber already. Not uh -huh. in, in Karim, in Uber, actually. So mm. Karim is uh, uh, invested through, um, I think, uh, Saudi Venture Capital and uh, uh, Sira Group and you know, other, other uh, national investors. And it was bought out by, by Uber later on yeah so this is uh, kind of one of the avenues that um, the government uh, is uh, trying to solve the unemployment problem so yep. i think there's a kind of a target for to uh, nationalize the uh, taxi sector or the, you know, the public transportation sector in saudi arabia so kind of uh, you know using your own vehicle as a taxi uh, maybe a good avenue you know for for locals to um, um, to exploit you know, here in the, in the in the region, so that's why there's an incentive by the government to invest in um, in Uber. And um, you, see, you see some strange yeah. things like, uh, for example, you, uh, you call an Uber or a Kareem, and uh, sometimes you get a you get uh, a Lamborghini to drive you around uh, Jeddah or Riyadh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah, that's, that's funny. funny. Yeah. Sometimes people are trying it out, you know. So. Uh, you never know what what kind of car. Uh. So it's growing. At least you could say uh, share is growing in um, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, sharing. It's good. Parts, yeah, okay. It's good because taxis, um, you know, is a um, uh, was it's it's not a very uh, well maintained sector, in, in especially in Saudi Arabia and the UAE it's yeah. a bit better, but in Saudi Arabia, uh, it's. Uh, you know, you have these old uh, busted cars and you don't know who the driver is. I don't know from which country he's in. And Yeah, uh, so there's no, no safety um, tools to yeah, provide. Yeah, no safety, yeah. No monitor, not, not that yeah. much monitoring you know, of, uh, of, the, of this um, of public transportation. Yeah. For example, buses are non-existent completely, you know, public transportation, especially buses, you know, are not existent in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Now you have in Riyadh, they're building the metro. So it's yeah. a wide metro network. So kind of these are, uh, they're scaling also the buses in uh, regionally and in. Uh, yeah. So, so since you touched on the, the public uh, transportation, so some like having a metro, having buses, having a intercities um, or, or intercity um, trains, so I know there is a train built between, or is it getting built between uh, cities yeah. in the U so, in so Saudi now, Arabia. Now you have uh, you have a train between Riyadh and Damam on the eastern side of Saudi Arabia, and okay. you have a train between Mecca, Jeddah, and um, Medina. So this is called yeah. Haramain, Haramain Rail High Speed Railway. So I've tried so, it once. It's, yeah. a, it's a good service, and um, you know you you see these kind of you know. Uh, public transportation improving in the country in general of course dubai from a long time they have uh, their own metro system so yeah 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 now, so, now they're moving now they're moving but to the next level now they're talking about the hyperloop 
Hyperloop, yeah. 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 But, but, I, but building... I, but I don't see any, any, any opportunities for, for us to invest or to you know, come up with a startup on top of uh, Hyperloop. Well, not on that, no, not on that. But the reason why I asked all these, so you got at the stations uh, or near the, these stations, um, maybe that's something else we could talk about is last mile, um, last mile transportation. So typically that would include uh, bicycles or e-scooters or anything of that format. Uh, that would be something worth exploring in that area. So it typically is another form of transportation. You just wanna, you left your, your uh, station, train station or metro, but you still need a maybe half a kilometer of walk or you're so close it's not worth, it's not worth getting a taxi, right? So currently um, you only have taxis now in the region. Yeah, exactly. You have exactly. in front of the station, a metro station, you have a taxi waiting for yep. you. So that would be another avenue. So it, it became super popular in the US and it faced a lot of issues and it still faces some issues uh, in the technology itself in terms of recharging and recollecting um, the... Uh, so that would, I think that's a, an area I, I, worth exploring. Scooters, I think it's a, a you know, interesting area Bicycles, I don't, I don't see. It's, it's not part of our culture, you know. You just, just see yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just the tool. I'm just referring to something familiar. But yeah, scooter, e-scooters, um, would be your last mile of trans, uh, form of transportation. Yeah. You have something so that is easy and um, uh, and easy for for uh, customers uh, to ride on, and doesn't yep. need any uh, any effort. So. I mean, it's, it's definitely a thing uh, uh, to think about. Yeah, yeah, it's and it's uh, it works well with the with any culture. So it depends on the culture. It works well. So some cities in the U.S. Uh, suffered this issue of, like I said, the they were getting left in random places, uh, no charge. Uh, you had to spend money to recollect them and charge them, and then put them back into their stations. Uh, but some other cities where they didn't have that issue because the user would drop it at the at the designated area or designated charge area and they just let, you know leave from there so that i think that's another potential it doesn't exist in the middle east but it, i think i think with the growth of the expensive infrastructure which is trains and, and metros and subways that would be an added on on top of it and it's it's a uh, it has two it serves two purposes entertainment which I think we're going to talk about that in a separate segment, but it also serves as uh, as uh, a means of transportation because tourists usually love to take those and you can use it as a last form. It's like you're running late for something and you want to use it coming out of a train. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, yeah, but. Uh, I do have a list of uh, interesting startups that you dug up in that region that fall under the form of transportation. So maybe we can touch up upon those. Yeah, sure. Next. Yeah. Uh, sure. We've, um, uh, of course, you know, a Kareem, which yep. is the biggest, biggest success uh, story being announced in the region. You have an Egypt um, former uh, Kareem employee who started a mini bus sharing service in Egypt, in Cairo, and I think in Alexandria now, and they're uh, trying to um, grow regionally. Uh, so that's uh, that's Swivel, right? Yeah, Swivel. 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 Yeah, yeah. Swivel. You have another startup there, but they're still, you know, struggling to find that right, uh, uh, you know, product market fit, uh, which is trying to address uh, called Fetcher. That's uh, I'll say it from the start. So it's called Fetcher. That Trying That's to, sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, addressing problem, so 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 there it's, it's a kind of a multiple. Uh, 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 you know, it's trying to, to solve the e-commerce problem, the last mile uh, issue for e-commerce because in uh, different countries have different addressing systems, and some countries they don't have a typical uh, way. The same. They don't have a standard way to, uh, like for example, in the U.S., where they depend on zip codes. Yep. Uh, so uh, they, here in the region, each country has its own way of doing things, and um, uh, it's kind of messy. So Fetcher, they they yeah, they don't care about addresses; they only care about the GPS. So you have your own your Fetcher application on your mobile. 
you just send them your GPS location and they deliver to that GPS location. That's it. So that actually, yeah, I just want to bring up another service. Um, it's just another service offered by uh, car companies that is similar to F Fetcher. Uh, the difference is um, your car is, ex is considered an extension of your property. So you own the car just as you own your house, if you're a owner. owner. Yeah. And uh, in Germany, and came from Germany and it's now in the US, um, they offer a GPS-based, because your car has a built-in GPS, GPS-based delivery to your car that gives the carrier a access to the trunk. And then, you know, you can drop off the, the package, uh, authorized, of course, you authorized, you know, your postal service to drop off a package in the trunk of your car. And you'll be notified that a package was delivered just in case you want, you know, for whatever reason, you don't want it to be delivered home first, you can have it delivered to your car. So it's a very similar idea to Fetcher, except that this is a, not a startup. This is controlled by OEMs. So interesting idea. But yeah, interesting. Fetcher makes, uh, makes a very interesting uh, middle solution, like uh, trying to bypass the non-existent, you know, address problem in the Middle East. Yeah, but it's still, I personally, I still believe it's uh, struggling. The, uh, one of their founders left the company a oh. long time ago, so it was still struggling, I mean, to find that right product market fit in the region. Got it, got it. Now, yeah. on the commercial, commercial side of things, so on the B2B landscape, you have um, some startups, for example, working, um, I believe, Tendered. They're working on um, renting, um, uh, you know, these large uh, um, construction vehicles, for example, heavy equipment vehicles, like cranes and uh, uh, cranes, uh, bulldozers, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so that's an idea. Uh, uh, um, locally here in uh, in Saudi Arabia, you have companies like Tawi, which you call them and, you know, rent uh, the crane, a crane or a vehicle. Um, and... Uh, uh, getting through the phone now it's what, what they're doing is try, uh, send you know aggregating these companies and building this marketplace online so that's yeah. that's kind yeah. of a, a, you know, a business a use case for that uh, on the other hand uh, you have services like trucker for example uh, and others uh, regionally which uh, you can book your uh, uh, trucks, trucks and vehicles, for example, either uh, if you want to move your ha home or um, your office or uh, your, let's say, a construction company that, that wants to move material between your warehouses and the sites, so you can book different trucks to come pick up the items and so on. So it's also a marketplace between uh, uh, cons consumers, businesses, as well as uh, the you know uh, truck owners on the other side. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that uh, yeah. Both ideas make sense. So so in terms of uh, yeah, there's one more layer if we're comparing to here, where you as a um, homeowner or like a private consumer might want to have some not exact not necessarily like a, the large scale um, commercial equipment, but you can rent out some utilities uh you know electric power power tools or um even like uh trucks to to move heavy heavy equipment so that is one layer below which i don't see i don't i'm not sure that is there's a market for that in the middle east not yet probably now there are and uh, which is prevalent in japan and the u.s there's a, a higher level of uh, you know these uh, um uh, you know heavy equipment uh, which they they don't rent you the equipment per se, but they rent you the service. Yep. So why do I what why do I need this equipment for? I need it for an excavation. So they calculate, for example, the how many square meters or square uh, oh, sorry how many cubic meters or cubic feet you need excavated from a site, and you pay per cubic. Uh, uh, feet or cubic meters that uh, are done. So there is a you know complex uh, modeling that is done, and uh, some of the uh, I'm not sure that the name of that uh, the company, but they have a fully aut autonomous heavy equipment vehicles. 
they come into the site, they drop them off on the site, and they automatically excavate the site. Yep. So based on a model and so on, and they and and you just pay for uh, how many cubic feet or how many cubic meters that you extracted excavated from the site. Yeah, very interesting. A kind of different model. Very Instead of you know renting the vehicles, you rent the service, or you you know, you just pay pay for the service. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it goes. Uh, I think it goes. You can go both ways. You can do it either way. Um, it typically depends on the engagement. Yeah, and who's the consumer? Because I mean, you can do the same with like with non transportation based. So like a lab, you can rent the whole lab for yourself and, and conduct your your work in it. Or like a specialized equipment, specialized tools. Yeah, it makes sense. That makes sense.